Thank you very much, Vincent, and good evening from the Royal Hospital in Kilmainham. And a very warm welcome to our listeners on RT Radio 1 and online all around the world to this special event to celebrate a special birthday. There are several notable birthdays on April the 13th. Eudora Welty, Butch Cassidy, Guy Fox, Al Green, Thomas Jefferson, Gary Kasparov, Samuel Beckett, and F. W. Woolworth. But we're here this evening to celebrate the birthday of the finest of them all, Seamus Heaney. We're here in many ways to thank him, not just for the work which has nourished us and delighted us and moved us and steadied us throughout the years, but also for the way he has carried himself and carried us. He's an international figure who has remained available and accessible at home, and we are very grateful to him for that. It's an approach which might have sometimes led all of us sometimes to take it for granted, the sort of approach that could lead to a situation where, in my hometown, when I happen to say to someone, isn't it great that Seamus Heaney has won the Nobel Prize? The response was, Kelly, were you not in for it? <laughs> Fortunately for Seamus, I wasn't. <laughs> but Seamus, you are in for it tonight. Indeed, you've been in for it for many months now. And again, I'm sure RTE is uh, particularly grateful to you for the ways in which you have collaborated and played ball with your customary grace and decency, with all those recordings and signatures and phone calls and faxes. No doubt you're wondering who's going to pop out of the birthday cake next. But just to say that we really do appreciate your being around and being so generous with your time. In this room tonight, and listening on radio and online, you have many relatives, friends, fellow writers, and of course, many admirers. And as I said at an event in Seamus' honour in Dunleary a couple of weeks ago, never forget, Seamus, that we're also fans. And we really do want to thank you for the poems, the encouragement, the good counsel, and all those stays against confusion that you have supplied us with over the years. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it really is a great honour for me to ask you to please welcome the birthday boy, Seamus Heaney. Ladies and gentlemen, from the moment this celebration was proposed, <clears throat> and especially after I heard that John Kelly would be standing up before me and for me indeed, I have been looking forward to it. But looking forward with mixed feelings, I have to confess. Sometimes Easter Monday would appear, as it always does, a luminous holiday. At other times, it was more like a deadline that loomed. I realized from the start, in other words, that the sense of occasion would be high here this evening. But uh, I wasn't sure that I could rise to it. It would be so high. At the same time, this celebration was being proposed by people so distinguished in Irish life and held in such esteem by myself personally, it would have been difficult to decline. I'm deeply grateful to those people and to the institutions and for the commitment and coordination of effort which brought us here this evening to EMA. I'm honoured beyond measure to be at the centre of such attention. I'm both elevated and obligated. I feel equally the need to be thankful and the need to take nothing for granted. And because my life has been unusually blessed, these feelings are habitual to me. From the moment my first book, Death of a Naturalist, appeared in 1966, when I was 27, until this happy birthday, ten more books on, during that whole time, my work has been favorably received, and I've been given credit 
and accord and awards of a sort I could not have imagined during the first two decades of my life. It all happened as if by magic. In my early 20s, I walked through the Kjodrichta of contemporary poetry, Irish, English, Scottish, Welsh, and American poetry. During those first years of creative excitement, when I discovered the company of poets, young and old, north and south, it was as if the morning fog that had once hung over the fields of Patrick Kavanagh's mucker, the fog where he met the god of imagination, it was as if that fog had descended on my own home ground in County Derry. I rhymed to see myself, as the last lines of the last poem in my first book put it, to see myself, to set the darkness echoing. Interestingly, to me at any rate, after that, very soon after the acceptance of Death of a Naturalist, at the first moment of literary notice, in the first flush of good reviews, I wrote another poem which I didn't publish until years later. It was called Anteos, and it was a monologue spoken by that character. In Greek mythology, Anteos was a giant born out of the earth, and therefore he consequently derived all his strength and prowess from contact with the earth. This meant that every time he was brought to the ground in a fight or a wrestling match, every time he seemed to be beaten, he wasn't beaten at all. Instead, he was gathering his strength, recharging the batteries, getting ready to rise again, fighting fit. I identified with this Earthman because I saw myself as something of an Earthman, somebody with his poetic feet very much on the local ground. At that stage, of course, I too felt fighting fit, having just written a book which began with a man digging, going down and down for the good turf, and ended with my young poet self looking deep into the trapped sky at the bottom of a well. I therefore regarded uh, Anteos as something of a guardian spirit, uh, something uh, who could can sponsor whatever poetic gift I might have. But at the same time, I was aware that Anteos, for all his strength, was far, for, far from invulnerable. I knew indeed that he would be defeated in the end by another hero, the mighty Hercules. Hercules turned out to be a match for Anteos in brawn, but more than a match in brain. For he realized in the course of a wrestling match, the way to defeat the giant was not to throw him down, but to hold him high. Not hammer him down, but to lift him up. The way to lower him was to elevate him. So instead of throwing his adversary, Hercules lifted him up until all the strength drained out of him, which is why I made Anteos's voice speak like this, speak his anxiety in the last lines of the poem. He says there, let each new hero come, seeking the golden apples and atlas. He must wrestle with me before he pass into that realm of fame among skyborn and royal. He may well throw me and renew my birth, but let him not plan lifting me off the earth, my elevation, my fall. By now it will be plain why I'm telling you all this. I mean to say that from the beginning I felt cautious about moments of elevation. Honours come unlooked for, they are pure gift and something to be grateful for always. But equally, they are something that have to be survived. They can create a profile larger than life. It is easier, admittedly, to survive an upgrading than a downgrading. <laughs> but even that is not without its dangers. It's no accident that when Satan wanted to tempt Christ, he took him up to the top of a high mountain. I felt, at any rate, even back in 1966, I felt that I had better take care to remain on the near ground level of my own life. At the same time, there remained also the necessity to deal with the wider, newer world that the life of poetry had led to. 
I mean the things which that world faced you with by way of challenge or offered you by way of reward. The course which I then learned to hold, the course I was made to hold by temperament and by a decided consciousness, was the Via Media. As I said in another poem, I grew up in between. I grew up where the word march meant not only enemies parading towards each other in a military fashion, but it meant also the hedge or the drain or the stream where fields belonging to neighbours bordered upon each other, where one side met the other side. And I would end up in between also, a northerner in the south, one born upon the agricultural earth of Antaeus, but destined eventually to live and breathe in the imaginative air of Hercules, subject at all times to the gravity and griefs of our common human condition, but at the same time susceptible to the lift of the heart when I lift up my eyes to the heavens. The import of the story about Hercules and Antaeus is complicated but potent. It tells us that we are made to live in at least two places at one time, in two domains that match and march each other. We should keep our feet on the ground to signify that nothing is beneath us, but we should also lift up our eyes to say nothing is beyond us. Over the years, I have been helped to hold this midway course by the love of the family I was born into, and by a loved one I met later who gave me the steadfast family that is now our own. In the course of my life, I was helped also by the steadfastness of friends, by the nurture I got as a young poet in the North when I had the camaraderie of other poets and slightly older artists and singers and musicians, not to mention certain bohemian broadcasters of the Northern Ireland BBC. I was helped too by my stints as a teacher here and in the great, tolerant, greatly generous Republic of American Letters, of which the Lannan Foundation is a shining example. Helped again when I moved with my family to Wicklow and then to Dublin just over three decades ago. Helped by the welcome I got then from writers and artists and musicians and yet another gang of bohemians and journalists, many of them associated with the Irish Times. And I was also helped at that time very particularly by the patronage of RTE, who gave me a job presenting a weekly books program on the radio when I was working as a freelance writer. That patronage, I am happy to acknowledge, continued, and it climaxed early last year in the course of a meeting with the Director General of RTE, Cahal Gowen, during which this weekend's mighty celebrations were proposed. As I said at the beginning, I was elated and yet a bit unnerved by the largesse of what was being envisaged. RTE Radio would produce an archival recording by me of all the poems in the 11 volumes published to date, a recording which would be supported by the Lannan Foundation and made available as a box set of CDs. There would be an hour-long TV documentary about me on the RTE Arts Live series. There would be a Lyric FM concert where, the three, where three Irish composers would be commissioned to respond to my poems, as well as a number of special radio programmes and even, indeed, a website. I was delighted, of course, but at the same time, as ever, cautious and inclined to demur. The argument which was put forward then to soothe me was that these salutes and celebrations would be concerned first and foremost with the work rather than the life. And even though I am not sure that you can ever separate the life and the work as trimly as that, I persuaded myself that it would be ungracious to decline. <laughs> then as soon as they had agreed to my apotheosis, as it were, by the vox in the box, a quite independent proposal came from Enrique Yoncosa, director of IMA, offering to run a sort of birthday Cayley here at Kilmainham. <laughs> With typical flaholas and style, Enrique promised us the use of these venerable premises for the broadcast concert earlier on, plus an exhibition space 
where his staff would arrange a display of books and artwork to run until June, not to mention the commissioning of two special prints by my friend Barry Cook. And lo and behold, thanks to the initiative and effort of these individuals and their devoted staffs, thanks also to the interest and sponsorship of the Department of Arts and Sport and Tourism, all these things have come to pass. I am so honoured, so plied with birthday gifts, I feel as privileged and almost as empowered as Prospero, the man who could call music from the air, consult his magic books, and like a documentary maker or a sound recordist, uh, uh, conjure into his presence scene from his past life. The Lyric FM concert with those commissioned pieces by Rachel Halstead, Kevin O'Connell and Ian Wilson was entrancing. Sounds and sweet airs that might have been heard on Prospero's island. The IMA exhibition not only highlights the beauty of the individual books, but has an extra dimension thanks to the display of works by the artists involved. And at this point, we especially celebrate the completion of those box sets of poems, impeccably recorded under the supervision of Tim Lahan and released with a cogent inter introduction by the poet Peter Sir. And then, to round off, tomorrow night we'll see the broadcast of the RTE television documentary, a beautifully made, honest to heavens, down to earth film by Charlie McCarthy called Out of the Marvelous. Much, therefore, comes full circle this evening. Friends whose work and whose company have helped me across the stepping stones of a life are here. Family and friends are here. All of you are here, whether in this room or listening on the radio. And all this is beyond expectation. But I no longer have mixed feelings. This is a totally luminous occasion. And if the wheel has come full circle, that only means that the wheel is about to turn once more. This birthday, in other words, isn't just about keeping going. It's about getting started again tomorrow morning when my inner Antaeus will have to rise as usual to meet my inner Hercules. <laughs> so I'm utterly grateful for the tonic of these tributes and these proceedings. They are not retirement presents, but ratifications and refreshments. Thanks to them and thanks to you, I will continue to live obligated and elevated more happily than ever, ever after. Thank you very much.